hi everybody. You're very welcome to the Next Generation uh, Breakfast Briefing here this morning. We're delighted to have Chris Flack, the CEO of Unplug, speak with us and for us today. Um, in 2003, when I first started my uh, first office job, there was no smartphone. I had no distractions on a daily basis on my bus, way into work, at lunchtime, at dinner time, and before I went to bed. There, were no face, there was no Facebook and nothing of me constantly scrolling, constantly looking for updates, either again at dinner time, in front of the family or just before I went to bed. There was no WhatsApp group and I don't know about you, but some of my WhatsApp groups now have 30 people in them in different locations all over the world, constantly pinging at me and trying to update me about various things that are going on. The recruitment industry is an industry, it is a human to human business and we rely on that phone contact and meeting people in person. But we're moving into an era now of technology taking over, you know, multiple databases, multiple online messaging tools and it has become a bit of a distraction for us. I was very lucky um, about a year ago to uh, go to uh, an event and hear Chris speak in relation to tech life balance and how it is starting to take over a little bit. Um, and from that, I really had some light bulb moments of where I felt that technology was affecting not only my personal life, but my productivity and my team's productivity. I came back into the office all excited, loads of ideas, and you know we've implemented a couple of them. We did a uh, traffic light system where we've introduced red, green, and yellow boxes for the top of our PCs, and we've really tried to encourage our staff to take back your, your home life. You know, when you're going on annual leave, take annual leave, have your annual leave. The CEO of Bell Labs has said that we have gone through a technology, technology revolution, but we're actually on the cusp of a human revolution. Not against technology, but to harness technology for, for the better uh, within our lives and within our office lives. And for me, Chris is really at the forefront of this and he's well ahead of it. Um, so hopefully he'll speak today and you'll hear a couple of hints and tips that really help you both in your own life and in your team productivity. Okay, I'm going to hand you over now to Chris. So good morning everyone, welcome. Um, thanks for being here so early and thank you very much to Next Generation for hosting us. And great to hear that you took some of those um, insights away and have actually implemented them as far as change in the organization. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Flack. I'm the founder and CEO of Unplug. And today I'm going to be talking to you about managing focus and attention in a distracted world. And Jennifer gave a really lovely introduction there, but I think what I found from speaking to a number of you already today that a lot of us are really struggling with this. So before I talk about managing focus and attention in a distracted world, I'd like to talk about unintended consequences. So the tech writer Paul Verillo recently wrote, when we invented ships, we also invented shipwrecks. The same is true of the aircraft industry, and we're just starting to discover the same is true of technology. We've seen in the last couple of months a lot of headlines around the potential risks of overuse of technology. We've seen headlines from the likes of internet pioneer Tim Berners-Lee saying we need to revisit the ethics around technology. And even The Economist at the end of 2017 predicted a major tech clash for 2018. It's almost as if we've had this lovely, cozy relationship with technology. It could do no wrong, it was wonderful. We're almost in this honeymoon period for a long time. And now we're just starting to realize that it is something that we need to pay attention to and actually start to manage. Now, I'm not here today to be dystopian, um, so I'm not gonna talk about running off to the mountains and totally disconnecting, because the good news is there are lots of shipwrecks, sorry, lots of ships now are no shipwrecks. There's loads of planes in the sky, as you can see here, but very few crashes. And our objective when we set up Unplug was to help you navigate these challenges, navigate these unintended consequences, and actually live a smarter life in the digital age. So my own background is in technology. I spent 15 years working in big tech consultancies, the likes of Capgemini and Avnet. And during that time, I saw a really huge change in technology. I saw lots of positive impacts, but I also saw the IT department in this small office in the corner all of a sudden become central, the CIO suite, central to every organization, and probably more relevant today, something that started to impact all of our behavior. And my own personal behavior was one of a, an early adopter, so I was probably the first one in the office to be online 24-7. My life was very much like this. That was kind of where I was. And I started to see my overuse had some negative impact on my productivity and well-being. 
So I became fascinated of the habits and science around habits of how ingrained technology has actually become to our everyday life. And that was really the seeds for Unplug, not running away from technology, but instead embracing it and building on research that shows if we make some small changes in how we use technology, we can have some really positive impacts on our productivity and our well-being. So we've now been delivering a range of behavior change programs for about two years, and today I'm going to give you some insights as to our learnings. I'm going to start by talking about the challenge, but for the majority of this morning, I'm going to talk about the solution. So it's going to be a very positive, but if you can just bear with me whilst I talk about the challenge. So we're going to start by talking about the first shipwreck, which is the smartphone, something that's only just really 10 years old. This was Tim Cook launching the iPhone 10 last year. And yet 10 years ago, this was predicted very cleverly by Steve Jobs to be something that was going to be everything to us. And it really is now. But the reality is 10 years ago, it was possibly more like this. But for those of us who are in business, we'll remember in 2007, this is what the kind of the high-end smartphone looked like. And we shipped around 120 million units of that worldwide. Would anybody be able to take a guess as to how many units were shipped worldwide of smartphones last year? One billion, it's a very good guess. Anyone else? Three, so we're somewhere in the middle. 1.8 billion, so this is something that's obviously, it's very much a mainstream product now. The majority of us in the Western world have access to this. And I think the key changes really come in our habits and how we use our time. So this is an average internet minute and a lot of these services and apps weren't around 10 years ago or very much in their infancy. And some of them, so the voice, first devices have only been used in the last 12 months. And I'd like to just play a very short video now which illustrates our relationship and how our behavior has changed with technology. Really? 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 It's time for a phone to save us from our phones. New Windows Phone, designed to get you in and out and back to life. Two interesting things there. Um, first of all, that was from 2010. Um, so we've changed a little bit since then, and that was also from Microsoft, who are no longer in the, in the phone business. Um, so Deloitte's have a, an annual mobile survey, and these are the findings from the most recent survey in Ireland. And just back to that video, you know, we really saw that we're kind of plugged in 24-7. This was reflected in the most recent findings. Just some key points here. So 40% of us check our smartphone first thing in the morning. That goes up to about 90% after the first hour. And it's interesting because right first thing in the morning, we essentially have a blank canvas. It's our best time for clear and critical thinking, yet we're reaching for our phone. We use it throughout the day, and obviously there's a lot of positive things there as far as collaborative working and information sharing. And then we find in the evenings around three quarters of us are checking our phones when we're with our loved ones and our family. And then down at the bottom, around 50% of us are checking our phones in the middle of the night. Now, once in a while, that's fine, but these are daily habits. And what happens then is it starts to slip into other parts of our life. So if we have a, a very focused project at work, or if we're reading our child a bedtime story, or if we're driving our car, we find that it just pops up as a habit. And a lot of the tech leaders are coming out now and actually saying, Technology is wonderful, but we just need to pay attention to how much we use it. So Mark Zuckerberg in his New Year's speech talked about the fact that we need to have time well spent on Facebook. And Tim Cook recently wrote that there is no real benefit from being plugged in 24-7. And if we think that this is something we're struggling with, we're not alone. The majority of people out there actually would agree with us. This is from the UK results from the Deloitte survey. That survey was actually titled Smartphone Blessing and Curse, an interesting title, and they found that 40% of all respondents said they struggled with actually managing their technology. I think the really interesting number here is the younger generation. It's 16 to 24-year-olds, so the graduates coming into the workforce, about 60% of those guys are actually struggling with this. I think the main struggle comes down to the concept of how it's impacting 
our work-life balance and how the boundaries have really become blurred as to our home life and work life. And EY and Fastnet both done a lot of research on this, showing that there's been significant change and impact with technology actually causing quite a big struggle around our work-life balance. And I think it's because we often find ourselves doing this. We're wearing two shoes all the time. So when we're at work, we're focused on work, but we also have a little bit of social going on. And then at home, we have that same concept. It's trying to balance both those things out, which is quite a hard struggle. Because I know, as Jennifer mentioned at the beginning, a while ago, when I first started working 20 years ago, and I left the office, I left the office. It was very simple. Whereas now I go home, and we have the flexibility to maybe leave the office early and go and pick up our children. But then in the middle of the evening, we might find that we're pulled into work email, and then we spend our time on that. It's quite hard to make sure we're having that control. And this brings us to this concept of psychological detachment, something that's really, really important if we're to restore and recharge. I'm just going to play a very short video of Barry Summers talking about this. Barry is the head of wealth management globally for Chase Manhattan Bank. Um, and I think what we have to show as leaders is that it's OK. I was telling you know, your story. I was on vacation um, last week. When, when, when you're on vacation, you should be on vacation. And I have found many times when you're on vacation, you know, and, and, and you have a conference call, and your boss puts a conference call on the schedule, like, you're probably going to call in. And as leaders, we have to make sure that we know when our people are on vacation, like, they can't call in. Because I, I was explaining to people, just so you know what that call does. It may be a half hour to you, but it's at 10 o'clock in the morning, so like at 9 o'clock, I'm starting to think about the call. Probably had to prepare for it last night if I did it right. Now I've got to leave my kids and my wife. I've got to be in a room. I've got to leave it. And then I do the call. And now after the call, like there's an 80% chance I'm in a bad mood. So you literally, <laughs> you just like ruin five hours of my life for that half hour call. Like it could definitely wait the next week. And I just used it as an example of way too many people um, at my company and other companies, they're, they're getting out of there as quick as they can because they are totally burnt out. So how does this impact us personally? Well, Accord, the Marriage Guidance Council, last year in their annual report, actually came out and said that one in five cases being presented to them is impacted by technology. So people are struggling to manage technology at home, and that's impacting relationships. And just to take this one step further into the world of intimacy, so the Irish Times Sex Survey actually found that 30% of people we're saying that technology has a negative impact on their intimacy. So it's worthwhile noting there's more interesting things to do than playing Angry Birds in the bedroom. Um, a lot of people want to know what that 2% is. We don't actually know. Um, if, anyone, if anyone does find out, then please do, please do let us know. So we often find ourselves in this situation. This might be at work, and it might be us doing this. It might be friends or family doing this. And it's not necessarily that that person wants to check their phone, but we're almost in this culture of responsiveness. And I have a short video here from Aziz Ansar just explaining this culture of responsiveness. I was in a relationship for a few years, and I think in the time I was in the relationship, all dating communication went exclusively to text. You can't call anybody anymore. If you call someone, they're like, what? Are you on fire? Then quit wasting my time. Text me that shit. <laughs> and I don't like texting people, especially girls. There's always miscommunication that happens. This is a situation I get into all the time. I'll text a girl. She texts me back right away. I text her back right away. She texts me back right away. I text her back right away. She texts me back right away. I text her back right away. She texts me back right away. Then I'll say something like, all right, cool. So you want to get pizza on Tuesday? And then I don't hear anything. And I'm like, what just happened? I know you read that shit. You responded to 20 other things I just said. What, do you not like me anymore? You don't have two seconds to say, yes, I want to get pizza, or no, I don't want to get pizza. Would you check your phone into a locker and go ride a roller coaster for a few hours? What's the deal? <laughs> and after a few hours of no response, I get real upset. And I just want to send a text that says something like, well, guess who just got uninvited to the pizza party? <laughs> you did, because I hate you now. Girl always writes something bad. Sorry, I was at my niece's ballet recital. We had to turn off our phones. Whatever, we're done. I finished that pizza hours ago. I went with my friend Brian. He's nice to me. <laughs> I'm sure this is something we can all associate with, this concept of social re reciprocity. Um, essentially, when we give somebody something nice, we expect something back. Um, and the same is true when it comes to technology. If we tag someone in a photo, we expect to be have a comment or maybe a like or similar. And I think in the workplace, the concept of email responsiveness is kind of up there with godliness. And just out of interest, 
how many do you, sorry, how long do you think on average it takes for us to open an unread email in the office? Any guesses how many seconds it takes us on average? 20. It's actually six seconds. So 70% of work emails are read within six seconds. So this whole concept of um, uh, social reciprocation and email, uh, the, the culture of responsiveness, is something that's very much mainstream to us. But it's actually been leveraged by technology itself. So if we look at the likes of IM and WhatsApp with the blue ticks, we now know when somebody's read something, so it's encouraging this reciprocity. And for those of you who have children, I don't know if any of you are familiar with snap streaks. For those of you who aren't, this is the ultimate in social reciprocity. What it does is when somebody's using Snapchat, if they share a message with somebody and that person reciprocates within a space of 24 hours, the product is gamified so they get a point, they get onto a leadership board and they get a specific badge. And what happens then is that's actually their affirmation within their group. So you're finding that young children, uh, the first thing they ask people is, what's your snap streak score? So just how, how technology is actually leveraging our social reciprocation and our attention. And just to focus on the attention side of things, I'm just going to play a very short video illustrating this. Hmm, that's not a bad photo. Laura posted a new album. A new video from John Oliver. Look at all these other videos. A new follower on Twitter. Yeah. A few hot takes from the debate last this night. This guy has a Wikipedia page. Oh, he grew up near New York. I grew up near New Just York. Just catch up on Instagram. Text from mom. Text from dad. Hey, dad, watch this kid shoot a firework at his dad. <laughs> Send. I'm sure, again, this is something that we've probably all experienced ourselves. And I think when we reflect on how the attention economy works and we look at the technology we use, a lot of social media is obviously free. And I think behind the scenes, it's not the technology companies aren't necessarily inherently bad, but their business model is based on the time that we spend on their technology. So the majority of the revenue, two of the largest technology companies out there, comes from advertising. So it's really worthwhile thinking how we're spending our time on technology because behind the scenes, a lot of the technology leaders are now coming out and actually being very honest and open and saying that when these technology companies were set up, a lot of the processes around the technology was actually designed to manipulate our attention. So how does this impact us in the workplace? So CareerBuilder did a survey with 2,000 HR managers in the US in 2016, and they found that three of the top four distractions in the workplace were technology related. Any guess what the other one was? Any guesses? It's actually gossip. Um, so I'm sure we could probably have uh, a talk just on that. Um, but yeah, so three of the top four distractions were technology. And I think what this results in quite often is we often have these days where we feel really, really busy, but we don't necessarily get that much done. Because typically we like to think we're doing task A, interruption comes along, so that might be checking that email within six seconds or another notification interruption. And we go back to the other, or the other task, or go back to the original <laughs> task A. But what typically actually happens is this concept of attention residue. So we have continued partial attention where we're still focused on the interruption. There's a professor out of the University of Irvine in California, Gloria Mark, who's actually shown that it takes us up to 25 minutes to get back to that task in hand. So distraction is causing big issues when it comes to productivity. And just in general life, we've seen a lot of headlines in relation to distraction in the last year. So the likes of the Oscars just over a year ago where Emma Stone received the wrong envelope uh, based on somebody looking at their Twitter feed. We've had a number of the road authorities out there saying that around 25% of road incidents are now caused by texting and driving and numerous other headlines relating to safety and distraction. So how does this make us feel as far as all this information, this kind of overload coming into us? Well, the next video is from Tommy Tiernan, and I know it's very early in the morning, there's some quite colorful language here, um, but he does get the point across, so I'll hand over to Tommy. There's so much, see, there's so much kind of information about the world nowadays and it, it, it's hard to know what you need and what you don't need. 24 hours of the day, seven days a week, this relentless stream of shit <laughs> is headed for your fucking head, right? 
And every time a piece of useless information goes in, it pushes older, wiser information further down into the muck, makes it harder to understand in dreams. Now, there's no escape in this fucking, it's relentless. Sandra Bullock's husband <laughs> is thinking of moving to Texas in order to be closer to their children. <laughs> How the fuck do I know that? even decided yet. He's only thinking about it. <laughs> I didn't go looking for that information, but it went into my head. Spent the whole day relaxing between my two ears. I meet somebody for a drink later on that night. The only thing, the only fucking thing I can think of saying to him I see Sandra Bullock's husband is thinking of moving to Texas. I can guarantee you'll remember that later on. Um, it's always the way. So this is how we often feel with this um, deluge of information. And I think Tommy just touched on a very interesting point there when he said he didn't go looking for the information, it was pushed on him. And this is the big difference between what we have now and previous infor information revolutions. If we think of the printing press or television, I know when I was growing up, I was an 80s kid, and my mum used to say to me, okay, you're gonna have square eyes because you watch too much TV. I don't have square eyes. And I think the big difference is this is pushed at us, but it's also personalized. And the Harvard Business Review actually coined this term a couple of years ago, that's the layer on top of the information overload. So not only do we have information overload, but we also have collaborative overload, where we're managing all of the various sources of information. I think this means we really then struggle, being drowned in information, really struggle to find wisdom. And this is critical when it comes to talent, man talent management and high-performing organizations. So deep work is a term that was coined a number of years ago by Cal Newport, a professor out of Georgetown University. And what he found was that a lot of his students, a lot of people he was working with, were spending their time just in this deluge of information and really performing quite shallow work. Whereas in order for us to really success and be successful in our work, we need to have deep work. So whether that's called focus, working with intention, or deep work, that's our objective. So, I've spent a bit of time talking about the challenge. I hope I haven't depressed you too much. Um, so the good news is I'm going to start talking about the solution now. Um, now, typically, we deliver our programs in half a day to a day. Uh, I'm conscious we have a very short time this morning. So what I'm going to do is just give you some very key insights and takeaways. Our program split into three different areas, awareness, reconfigure, and boundaries. But before I talk about the components, I just want to talk to you about how we deliver. One thing that's really, really important to us when we're working with habits and behavior change is to focus on systems as opposed to goals. So for us, it's always about delivering a sustainable program. So the first component of that is actually working with the individual organization. That might be around working with HR on duty of care around how work-life balance is impacted by technology. It might be working with the CIO's team around the impact of digital transformation on humans. And then when we deliver, we do workshops and masterclasses that are very much solution orientated. So working with case studies and seeing what's the best fit for each organization. And the last part is key just to make sure that's sustainable and habits are maintained. We have a number of touch points that follow up, including coaching and emails. So to start with awareness, when we're looking to manage something, we always have to start by measuring it. So I'm going to give you a couple of corporate examples to start with, and then we'll look at some individual examples. So there are a number of academics out there looking at quantified studies around this. So one of them is led by Monadipa Tarafta, who's out of MIT, and she worked with IBM and Intel and actually developed a metric called a techno stress score, which showed the impact on work-life balance based on how much technology people were using. And from that, IBM and Intel were then able to change their work practices, and I'll reflect on how Intel's done that later on in this talk. Another example, this is actually a, qualifi a qualitative um, information as far as 
change and research. This was Boston Consulting Group. So Boston are known as a really, really high performing organization, probably one of the ones that you'd assume are always on. And what they found was it was having a really negative impact on some of their projects and that people weren't able to take time off. They were finding a real struggle with getting uh, any time and time away from the projects to recharge. So they assessed all the projects and they actually put a policy in place. The project was called PTO, Predictable Teaming and Open Communications, and they collectively agreed for each project to have specific time off. And ongoing, what they've found since, and this has actually come from the senior leadership team, this year, so 2018, they've now gone up to number fourth in Fortune 100 Best Places to Work, and the SLT have put a lot of it down to this PTO project. And why do we need to measure how much technology we're using? Well, this is an interesting experiment from Cornell Food and Brand Lab. So some of you might be familiar with this. This is the bottomless soup bowl experiment where participants were fed soup and there was a funnel placed underneath. And for 75% of them, they just carried on eating. I think typically this is what we often do with technology ourselves. And we find that we have the endless scrolling on most of social media. For those of you who, who read the likes of the Daily Mail, you know there is no bottom. It just continuously scrolls. And then we have autoplay in the likes of Facebook, Netflix, and YouTube. So just looking at how we can measure this personally and individually, there's a couple of examples. The first is an app that's available on iOS. And just so you know, I'll be sending out a summary slide deck with all of these in so you don't need to make too many notes. So Moment essentially runs in the background when you're using technology, just tracking what you're, use over, what you're using over different periods of time, different types of technology. And you can actually track this across multiple devices. So we've seen people use this with families. We've also seen people use it in specific teams. So we worked with an agile development team who when they were doing the specific focus on project design, they wanted the team to just use specific tools and they were able to focus in on which tools are being used at different times of the day. It also then has limit reminders so you can actually maintain positive habits off the back of that. Another example, this one is on Android and on desktop. It's called Rescue Time. This is actually one I really like because I like dashboards. So we found a lot of SLTs who like dashboards and KPIs really like this. One interesting thing that Rescue Time does is it actually categorizes technology into good and bad use of your time. So when I'm developing a slide deck, my productivity pulse will be high if I spend a lot of time in PowerPoint, and it'll be low if I spend a lot of time on social media or entertainment sites. And the reason we measure, just coming back to that point of the, uh, the Cornell University program, this is a screenshot with Aidan Healy, our head of learning and development, and Vogue Williams in a documentary last year. The reason we need to measure is many of us underestimate how we use technology and how much we use it. So Vogue Williams actually guessed that she used technology about social media three to four hours a day, and it was actually seven to eight hours a day. So the second stage of our program is called Reconfigure. A lot of this has come from a lot of the products we use are gamified. I touched earlier on the likes of Snap, Snap and Snap Streaks. But there are some very positive products out there as well that are gamified because this is a really good way of getting us to improve our habits. But just to touch on one that was never designed to be gamified, but through our culture of responsiveness, this intermittent variable reward is something that's prevalent for all of us who use email. And this is something I personally used to struggle with when I worked in a company about six years ago. I used to find that the bottom right-hand corner would pop up and take my attention away. And back to that concept of it taking me 25 minutes to get back to the task in hand, I was shallow tasking all the time. So all I did, quite simply, was just reconfigure. And this is one of the simplest things you can do with your email software where it's just to prioritize so that you're only seeing emails that you actually need to see. So you're not seeing every email that comes in, just maybe from your line manager and your CEO. So personal reconfiguration. Um, for the majority of us, when we get our phones, we keep the notifications as it is, so factory settings. And what we ideally should do is actually have a look and have a, a notification audit so that we're actually in control. Because a lot of those notifications, things like if we have a battery app and it's telling us we need to update it, we don't really need to know that. But if we have a business deal coming in or if we're waiting to hear from our um, babysitters, we do need to hear from that stuff. So it's worthwhile just going through and having a look at what you actually need to prioritize within your notifications. Back to the idea of gamification, let's look at our home screen. If we think of the colors here, they're all 
bright. A lot of these were actually designed to instigate our attention. So one really simple thing you can do is put them into folders, which means some of the colors are taken away. You can also change your phone into black and white and grayscale. That works for you. And what I actually do is I have a home screen that's really, really simple, and I have some of the more tempting apps on the second and third page so that my muscle memory is actually something that I have to be aware of. So the ideal way of working is this concept of batch processing our emails. This is something that's really, really hard when we're using email, but I'm gonna give you a very good example of a company where this has worked very well. Now, Atos, for those of you who don't know, are a management consultancy, management consultancy there are about 70,000 people in Europe. So a very large organization, very high performance organization. And Thierry, their CEO in 2011, wanted to have a new way of working around communication. And his whole focus was that email was hitting on productivity because people weren't batch processing. They were just checking, checking, checking. So what they actually did was they replaced internal email with a social networking tool, which meant they had collaborative working around projects and processes and people. And as a result, people were able to batch work because nothing was pushed to them. They just went into the collaborative tool when they needed to access specific project information. And as a result, productivity has raised significantly. So the last stage I'd like to talk about is boundaries. And to start, I'm just going to touch on some research again. So this is a chart that came out of Stanford Persuasive Lab. So some of you might be familiar with the name BJ Fogg. He heads up this lab. And BJ is actually known as the billionaire maker because graduates from his class have gone on to set up the likes of Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. And this is a really simple chart that he has within his behavior studies showing when, we're mo when, we're, when something's easier to do, we're more motivated to do it. And even if it might not be the best thing for us to do. So I'm gonna give you a really simple example of this. This is a brand that I'm sure a number of us will be familiar with it. A lot of us know that it's very nice to have, but not necessarily good to have all the time. Now, Domino's were struggling with how motivated we were to get pizza because of how easy it actually is to do. Because there's quite a few friction points for us to go through before we do something like ordering a Domino. We have to find the phone, we have to open the phone, et cetera, et cetera. So what Domino's actually did was reduce these friction points through technology, came up with this concept, which is building on the Amazon one-click ordering, which is zero-click ordering. So essentially, you open up your phone, you wait for 10 seconds, and if you haven't done anything, it will order your pre-ordered, so your favorite pizza, and it's all pre-configured with your credit card. Not content with that, because that's still one, one thing to do, <laughs> they released the one-click order box. This isn't available in Europe as yet. Um, <laughs> So this, this essentially was cutting out all the points of friction down to the point that you'd come home from work, push the button, and within a certain period of time, your pizza is delivered. So just um, one final piece of research which really builds on this. So this study, the iPhone effect, has been re replicated numerous times. And what it shows essentially is that when we have our phones in front of us, um, our conversation and our empathy is actually diluted. So even if the phone is switched off and if it's turned over, we'll be thinking of what's on the phone. So it's very similar to, if we just think back to the example of Domino's pizzas. If I had a whole table here, if we were just before lunch and it was full of Domino's pizzas, you'd be thinking, I quite like the Domino's pizzas. I have no interest in what Chris is talking about because I'm hungry. It's the same thing with technology. You might be with somebody who's really important in front of you, but everything is available on your phone. So it's a really interesting study. And there's been a number of workplaces who've looked at this and put really good interventions in place to manage this. So Lacey Robertson, who's head of HR at eBay over in the US, she actually has a no device policy in all senior management meetings. And her whole objective was to manage focus. Closer to home, some of you might have read this case study. It was in the Irish Independent last year. Sinead McSweeney, who's managing director of Twitter Island and head of policy for EMEA, same policy around no devices in senior management meetings, but for her, it wasn't just about focus, it was actually about empathy and having that human-to-human -human contact, as Jennifer was talking at the, about at the beginning. And just to reflect briefly back on the work that Monadipa Tarafta and her team did around techno stress. So one of the clients she worked with was Intel, and as a result of them having a techno stress metric, so actually measuring how technology was impacting work-life balance and productivity, what they have now is they have specific quiet time. So if you have a focused project that you're working on, you can request to have quiet time when all your distractions, technology distractions are switched off. You can have a, a no email Friday. 
So just back to that idea of creating friction so that we're less motivated to do things that might be not the best use of our time. We can create virtual boundaries around the technology we use. And there are a number of apps that can help you to do this. This is Freedom. This is on iOS. And essentially what this does is you create a block list and then you can access certain sites, certain apps at certain times of the day. So to give you a really simple example here, you have one session in the morning, you have a morning productivity Personally, what I do when I'm at work, I have all of my social media limited and I have full access to my work tools. And in the evening, it switches over the other way so I have limited access to my work tools and more open access to my social media. Again, just creating just a little bit of friction so it's harder for us to do. And you can override these tools, but it's the whole point of it's a bit like putting a cookie jar on a higher shelf. By the time you get there, you actually think, is it the right use of my time? Another example of this is called Flipped. This is available on Android. And essentially, Flipped is slightly different. It creates a boundary around all of your applications except for phone and text. So when you flipped your phone, it essentially puts it into a, a smart mode mode. Um, and what that enables you to do, if you're having a focused project and you still want to be receiving phone calls or receiving text messages, but nothing else, you can do that for an allocated period of time. So just to summarize, Many of us do have this compulsive relationship with technology, and I know having spoken to you earlier this morning and with Jennifer's introduction, we're very much aware of the impact of this always on culture. But there is good news. There are some really simple things we can do. Um, so just to summarize very quickly, the first one is really to start to understand how much technology we're using and the impact that's having, then to look to reconfigure, so to make changes in our technology, whether it's with our notifications or how we use our email, and then to start, oh, to start to put some boundaries in place, whether that's virtual or actually changing the way that we use technology. We have a very simple choice. Essentially, our potential and our staff's potential is in our hands. We can either shape the digital world or we can let it shape us. So a little bit about Unplug. So we, as I mentioned, run a range of behavior change programs. We work both here in the UK and more recently in Germany in both the private and public sector. And we'd love to talk to you about how we might be able to help you and your staff to manage focus attention in a distracted world. I'd say a big thank you to Next Generation, Jennifer and Linda and the team, and Emma for helping hosting us this morning. And I'd like to open the floor to questions, please. Uh, Chris, thanks very much. Um, Carl Widger from Metas Ireland. Um, uh, fantastic presentation. I, I'm uh, particularly interested in the app where you can track your family's uh, screen time. And was wondering, is there a way that you could uh, once they get to past their limit, that screen's shut down, or yeah. is that something that you would recommend? Uh, yeah, prohibition's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> but uh, ju just, um, ju just to touch on that, because the majority of work is corporate. We do two days a month in schools. Uh, and we actually, I gave a, a parenting talk there in Dunleary Library um, on Tuesday night. So it's a slightly different message, because um, that's really about having a conversation with your children. But I think when you've measured it first of all, it's worthwhile having the chat where you're saying, okay, this is how much you use technology, this is how much I use technology, trying to be the role model of your switching off at a certain time, so they will as well. But there are a number of different technologies that can help you do that, so Moment won't actually switch off the technology. There are some really simple things you can do, like do the, the timer on your, um, your Wi-Fi, so it switches off at a certain time, or you can, specifically for families, there are products like RPACT and iKids, which I can send you information on which create boundaries and switch off times at certain times. Hey Chris, thanks a million for a great presentation. Definitely worth getting up early for. Um, I'm just wondering, you mentioned uh, things like um, no email Friday in terms of what companies are using to try and uh, get higher productivity. With the companies you've worked with, what has been the most effective um, actions that they've taken? Every company's different. Um, I think the one thing, just to, to give it as a caveat there, this is a very new challenge. You know, the technology is only 10 years old, so companies are really kind of, they're, they're almost just testing different areas to see where the, the pain points are. I think typically one of the first things we come across is just this overall concept of I can't switch off. Um, you know, the, the concept of being at home but still buzzing, as, as it were, from the amount of information we've consumed. So a lot of that really comes down to simple boundaries of having technology, maybe not using it after a certain period of night, trying to, period in the night, trying to keep technology out of the bedroom, 
big impact on sleep, and specifically back to Carl's point with children, it's a huge detrimental impact on, on children's sleep. So if you're looking to keep the smartphone out of the bedroom, do try to upgrade your alarm clock, because what we find is if we're taking something out, back to that concept of prohibition, we're essentially punishing ourselves, because smartphones are really good alarm clocks. So try to get yourself a nice alarm clock, and if it's for children, try to get them something that's themed around, whether it's a football club or Peppa Pig or whatever they might be into. But boundaries is, is a key one. It's quite a challenging one. We were working with a company recently in, in Germany where they were setting up a new office and all of their staff were remote. And they very rarely met together and they were struggling with exactly that point and that the relationships they were de developing weren't that deep um, because whenever they were having the conference calls, they were doing multitasking on the side. And I think the key focus there was to try to focus on the benefit of having that intention. So back to the objective that Sinead has at Twitter, you know, as well as it being around focus, it's actually looking at the quality of the relationships <clears throat> and obviously, that's dependent on what they're doing. But say, for example, at sales staff, as Jennifer touched on earlier, from a recruitment point of view, you know, you need to have that quality of conversation. But it is, it's different for every organization. I'm happy to talk to you further about that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Um, I suppose some people can feel that you're coming in and you're, we're going to take everything away or we're taking something away that they really want. Is there any tips around how we can bring staff on the journey to understand that we're not trying to take something away, we're trying to improve in, in another area to do that? Yeah, I mean, one thing that we were very um, aware of right from the beginning was we, despite our name, we are not about switching off. This is really, you know, I guess the name is to raise awareness around the fact that it's, it's technology related because... Technology is the elephant in the room, so we can't run away from it. I think as far as um, the concept of taking away, one thing we try to reflect on always is those pos positive benefits. So looking at, if we take the example of the Boston Consulting Group uh, and the fact that they've actually raised the profile of the organization in the Forbes Top 100 list based on a project that's actually saying that they need to manage their technology better and they need to have discussions and metrics around people actually switching off, that's a very positive benefit related to the output of changing the way people are using technology. But taking it away, it's a bit like back to the prohibition point, you know, you're kind of punishing somebody because we all have these very ingrained relationships with them. And it's, it's something that we need to always focus on from a positive point of view. You know, we're very careful never to use words like addiction and detox because they're very negative words instead of using words like attention and focus and performance, which are always the, the upsides. Yeah, I think, I think the one thing to note is to try to find out what type of work they're actually doing. Because um, it's very different when they're passively using their phone to actually be an interactive. So if they're sitting there scrolling through news feeds all the time, that's a very different way of working than actually being interactive and working on projects and working collaboratively and having conversations with people. So even maybe having a small project where, say for example, Moment, we worked with a team who they had a project on agile development and they wanted to make sure everyone was using those tools. So they were focusing on the positive, but at the same side, they're also getting a review of what tools people were using. And obviously, you know, you don't want to be draconian, so you can have that as a very open discussion and show what tools you're using as well. But I think that key point of measuring and the, the point of actually looking what they're using as opposed to just how much they're using it. Because back to the, the example with Vogue Williams, you know, once you actually present that to somebody and they realize that, hang on, I'm spending a lot of my time at work on technology. So the, the research Monodipa Tarafta did in, um, in Intel, I think they actually showed that something like 40% of the workforce were using Candy Crush every day. Um, and it was only when they actually looked at that and said, okay, well, hang on, <laughs> it's great for five minutes, but Candy Crush isn't something you play for five minutes. Um, you know, so it's, it's having those numbers. And when, when people realize, then they start to look at making change. It's a real challenge, you're right, and this is something that because it's so new, um, we have seen companies have policies around just having work phones at work, uh, and that obviously then means you need to provide your workforce with work phones, and you can't bring your personal phones, at least have them on the desk, and kind of the more draconian measures around that. So in France, they have uh, a new ruling that's coming out this autumn, which is for schools where there's going to be no smartphones allowed in primary and secondary schools. I'm not sure that's necessarily the best example because everyone has different uses of technology. You know, there might be some project teams um, that need to have access to that. So, but, but I think it is looking at the examples that are out there and I can have a chat with you afterwards at some companies and, and what 
sort of different interventions they're making, but it needs to be something that awareness is raised, first of all. So having the conversation is key. Because back to the point I made earlier, a lot of people don't actually realize what they're doing. Because most graduates, obviously, when they turn up at work, they want to impress, they want to really perform. Um, and if they're told that, hang on, you know, a lot of your time you're spending on Candy Crush, they might not realize that. Because back to this habit and we aren't aware of a lot of our behaviours. Otherwise, people wouldn't be checking their phones when they're driving, but the majority of us are. So, any other questions? I was very thankful for my iPad and my smartphones during the snow, because when it came to day three and four, I was like, stay on it for six hours, I really don't care. I'm not going out to build a snowman again. Um, so there's some um, feedback forms there we'd love you to feed out, f fill out, and Chris will be available for any, any uh, conversations that you want to have with him afterwards. Thank you so much for attending. We really do appreciate it, um, and we make sure you're invited to the next one that we'll be doing um, in the back end.